Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very happy to be joined by Dr. Stephen Coslin for the third time. So this is his refrigerator magnet qualifying appearance. So welcome back to Trending in Education, Stephen. It's a pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting when you do start having multiple touch points with someone, there becomes a natural narrative arc to the conversations where when we first met, we were just getting to know each other, getting to know your body of work. And then from there, last we met, you had basically written a book about active learning in the digital age, but you were talking about how you did things in reverse, where you wrote the book without necessarily having the, the publishing angle lined up. But, but since we talked, the book is out there. You've been spreading the word, getting feedback. And uh, that's really what we wanted to talk about today. So yeah, so how have you been? What's been going on? I've been fine. Someone like me who likes to read and and write probably suffers a little less than many others when Mm -hmm. being forced to stay inside so much. But that said, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, the, the juices flow with spring coming and whether staying inside so much is going to be as appealing. Yeah, but the writing and uh, and even the teaching now is a new thing. The ability to go from writing one moment to be teaching the next moment is a, a bit of a new phenomenon for many of us because of uh, the pandemic and the fact that the teaching is all virtual nowadays. You're someone who has a depth of experience, whether it's Minerva or, or many of your other teaching engagements, which you're doing at Boundary College. You have a lot of experience with different dimensions of online teaching. You've also been a little more hands-on since we talked last, teaching and working on your book. And can you remind me the name of the book? The book is is called Active Learning Online, Five Principles That Make Online uh, Courses Come Alive. The title explains what it's about. It's five principles that I pulled from the literature, Science of Learning, and I show not, not only how to use the principles by themselves, but also how to use them in combination. Yeah. And also talk about how that can be done in a synchronous setting, like what we're doing right now, Yeah. Zoom or whatever, Mm -hmm. and an asynchronous setting. So this idea of active learning asynchronously, I think is is fairly new. I don't think Mm -hmm. there's much of that out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And I'm always struck by uh, the fact that while you and I are live now, the way this will ultimately be delivered is asynchronous. And some of the distinctions that we make between synchronous and asynchronous, they're a little bit messy. And I do find that even my experience of being connected with someone and and getting the sense of intimacy that I really like around live sessions, I frequently find that formats like podcasting and other emerging capabilities frequently get close to what you experience with live. But what I like what you've done in the book and what you've taught me about a bit is that there are some principles around how our cognitive systems are wired that makes it more effective to teach in certain ways and more uh, effective for us to really learn in better ways. Can you give a quick summary of what the five are? And then we can get into the gestalts because I'm all about gestalts. I like the way things relate to one another, but uh, can you walk through the the, the five uh, maybe quickly and then we can dive into each? Sure. In the spirit of interactivity, let me ask you a question. Okay. Do you ever at the end of the day, reflect back on things that happened during the day? Yes. Okay. Here's a real question I want to ask. What percentage of what you recall at the end of the day, do you think at the time it was happening, you intentionally tried to memorize it so you'd be able to recall it later? Right. Uh, Much smaller, like I think 10, 15%. And I do remember we talked about this before too. It's a relatively small. So I've done this with over a thousand people. I haven't counted, but I've done it in large groups, probably a couple thousand what I do is I ask people to raise their hand if they think they intentionally tried to memorize 50% or more. No one has ever raised their hand. Yeah. And I go to 25% and I've had three people raise their hand, Yeah. whatever that means. And then I go down in increments of five and the modal number seems to be about 5%, which is yeah. really interesting because that suggests, and the, the data consistent with this, that about 95% of what you recall at the end of the day, you didn't try to memorize at the time it happened. Yeah. It's called incidental learning. Mm-hmm. What that's about is if you pay attention to something and think about it, digest it, you're likely to remember it as a byproduct. Mm-hmm. So a lot of memory is a byproduct 
mm. of processing. That's the first principle. Mm -hmm. I call it deep processing. Yes. And a crucial thing here is it really depends on what you focus on as to what you're going to remember. It's not that one type of information is privileged. You can focus on the color of something or the sound it makes or the meaning of a word. Whatever you focus on, that is what you're likely to remember, that aspect. Yeah. What that implies is you have got to have clear learning objectives. Mm -hmm. you got to know what it is you want the students to learn yeah. at the outset. Because you want the learning outcomes, what actually happens, to align with the learning objectives, what you wanted to happen. Right. And it's crucial if you use this principle because you have to know what to focus them on. So that's principle one. And deep processing, yes. And and then you and you design things that require more deep processing, facilitate deep processing and focusing on the the outcomes that demonstrate deep processing. Right. You design activities to induce deep processing. Mm -hmm. They can be a debate, they can be a problem solving session yeah. alone or in groups. Yeah. They can be role play with many different ways to do it. Yeah. But the, the key is to make sure they're focused on the material that's going to lead them to master the learning objective. That makes sense. Also, uh, deep processing, not a bad band name. It's an okay <laughs> band name, I would say. Not bad, you know? I like it. Yeah, like experimental, it. maybe a little. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We'll come back to that. Okay. But, uh, so that's the first principle deep processing. All right. Second one, so deep processing comes out of many authors have documented mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. The next one, there's one guy in particular named uh, Anders Ericsson who recently passed away, who really drilled deep on it. It's called deliberate practice. Yes. What that's about is identifying, usually via feedback, where the hardest patches are for you. Yep. And then drilling down on those. Mm -hmm. so there are various ways you can identify what you need to focus on. It's mm -hmm. not just mindless repetition, not just practice, do it, do it over yeah. and over, over. It's deliberate, you're focused. There's a technique called interleaving. Yes. Where for example, if you wanted to teach students about different art styles, impressionist, hyperlist, whatever, you could block them, that is show them a bunch of the same type and then a bunch of another type and so on, or you could interleave them. Yeah. Get them mixed up. Turns out interleaving is much better. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that you do a little comparison and contrast. You start noticing mm. what the distinctive aspects are of, say, impressionist versus hyper-realistic or whatever. Yeah. And that directs you what to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. But my favorite example of a variant on this deliberate practice comes from Benjamin Franklin. Incredible. Someone described him once as the first American. I think that kind of fits. Mm. He, he was amazing. Mm -hmm. But one of the things he did, he decided he wanted to learn to write well. So he would read fairly widely. And when he came across something he thought was particularly well written, he remember, he'd say, okay, ah, that one. And then later, sometimes a couple of days later, he'd try to write it down in his own words. Mm. And then he would compare what he had written to the original and look for the differences and tune them up. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So he yeah. used a model. He used a model to get feedback to engage in deliberate practice, to focus yeah. in on what he really needs to learn. So that's the second principle. Yeah, and that's someone as a sports fan, that immediately resonates with me. Anytime you're learning some repetitive, like a golf swing or a free throw shot, or you're practicing your ground strokes in tennis, it's not just the repetition, it's the repetition while focusing on what happens when I hold the ball differently, or what happens when I, I swing thought when I'm swinging the iron is different than when it is when I have a driver. It's the combination of the many reps. People frequently say the 10,000 hours thing, which was popularized by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Any thoughts on that connection there? Well, yeah, it's based on, the, on Anders Ericsson is probably okay. the main guy in that, same guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's based on his estimate of how much deliberate practice. So it's not just 10,000 hours. It's got to be 10,000 hours of this kind of practice. Yeah, yeah. And I'm immediately drawn to uh, Alan Iverson when we start talking about practice. You talk to me about practice. And that's a reference to uh, to an NBA basketball player's famous uh, news conference. But please, we'll continue. I'm trying to keep it elusive and maybe elusive sometimes, uh, Stephen, just to keep the audience entertained. But we're on the, we're on the third principle. Ah, okay. We had... Deep processing, we had deliberate practice, dual coding. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you show and tell, mm -hmm. it's going to be better than either just showing or just telling. Yeah. So illustrating with a relevant picture, not, any, not a decoration, a picture that really speaks to the point, 
yeah. along with describing it is going to boost memory. You actually have different parts of the brain that get engaged. So you have, yeah. you know, two shots that later remember it. And that's connected so, to the picture superiority effect too, right? That's the picture superiority effect is in some ways supported by the dual coding principle, right? But there's some connection. Yeah. It, it turns out something like 60% of our brains are involved in vision. And the areas that process information are also largely involved in storing it, which is consistent with the deep processing mm -hmm. principle, by the way. Mm -hmm. So visuals tend to be remembered better than just verbals, but the verbals do two things. They, A, present another channel, as it were, another way to remember it. Yeah. B, they also can focus you on what in particular you should be paying attention to when you're mm -hmm. looking at it. So you mm -hmm. see these three principles are related. They're, they all involve focusing, paying attention, processing. Yeah. So the, the, the more you do, the deeper, the better it's going to be. Right. But focus on what's most important or get the students to. That's deliberate practice. Yeah. And then dual coding, again, you have them focus now on two different things. Yeah. Which may interact, in fact. Mm -hmm. So those three kind of form a unit. Yeah. And that unit we can call a chunk. And that's the next principle. I, I see, I, I see what you did there. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. There's an old Silicon Valley expression called eating your own dog food, <laughs> which I, 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 especially I, pre I prefer drinking my own champagne. It's because you have champagne to drink. So <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the idea is like in that, that book that you mentioned, I tried to have as many demos and use as much active learning yeah. as I possibly could to teach about active learning. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. That fourth principle is called chunking, mm -hmm. which is we humans can really store only three or four units at the same time, but each of those units can contain three or four units. A unit is an organized set of other things, pieces, bits, yeah, and which can be organized either by their proximity in time or space. So for example, in a lecture, if you pause, mm -hmm. you can define the boundary of chunks by having them group by proximity and time, but also have similarity. So if you address the same topic and integrate it, that can also serve lecture to create a chunk. Yeah. And there are various other ways to do it. Yeah. So it's super important that you have no more than four because people just can't take it in. And we always get this wrong. We always think it's more than, because I, because also I think I remember you talking more about three too. So it's like, yeah, maybe it's think three. about it in, when you're designing this stuff, keep it simpler. And yeah. remember that we only have so many slots free. And as a, the father of a two-year-old, I do feel like one of my slots of working memory is pretty much always occupied by him, especially if we're outside of the house. But it does seem like we don't have a lot of this to spare, which is why so much of the noise that we're battling just in our lives in general is such a problem these days. But then on top of that, frequently somebody who's writing a, a lesson for me, is trying to teach me, is giving me seven things to remember when in reality, uh, that's probably more. And even the way you chunk the first three just now is to help us digest the five, because five is a number you're gonna land on a lot. So be thoughtful about this kind of rule of three or four, just keep it fewer rather than more. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So that last principle, yeah, uh, I call associations, which is broad and it's really three domains in which you can apply this principle. The first is when you organize information. So it relates to chunking. You can actually use associations to chunk. If I showed you a bunch of letters, like KGB, IBM, CBS, NBC, if you tried to just memorize those as individual letters, you forget it. Right. But if you realize that they're three letter acronyms, mm -hmm. which re requires associating to what you already know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and using that to organize, then it gets pretty easy. So you can use associations to organize. Yeah, You can use them to store information in memory. So there's something that used to be called the paradox of the expert. It was noticed that the more you learn about something, the easier it is to learn even more. Mm -hmm. And that seemed counterintuitive. Why aren't you filling up the memory banks? There's less left over. It's the opposite of that. Right. And the, the answer is, the more you know, the more hooks you've got, the more right. things you can associate to. Mm. So the easier it gets to integrate it in. And then the last part is retrieval cues. So let me give you an example that uses all three of these. I have a really terrible memory for uh, names. I've had this my entire life. So when I meet somebody for the first time, what I 
do is I say, Michael, what other Michael do I know? Or the person I know has the same name. Yeah. And I visualize somebody who I know pretty well, that name. And then what I do is I look at your face in this case, yeah. for features that are similar to his. Wow. So in this case, it's your nose. Yeah. And a little bit of your forehead. I then imagine his face and your face and I associate those features. So next time I see you, yeah. Okay. I've now used my knowledge of him to organize mm -hmm. features mm -hmm. in, in coding, we call it, to get it in in the first place. Yeah. And then because I'm going to associate it with him, it's easier. Mm -hmm. And then later, for the retrieval part, when I run into you on the street, I'll scan your face until something reminds me, mm -hmm. like your nose and forehead. Yeah. Or whatever. Interesting. Of him, yeah. and I'll get his face up, and I'll remember his name, and I'll know that's your name. Wow. It actually works pretty well. Yeah. It works pretty well. And by the way, this is actually an example of combining different principles because we're not only use association and partly, not entirely do chunking, but also involves deep processing. Yeah. Because to do this, you got to think about it, which is going to also result in better memory. And I was even thinking there's some dual coding there too, because you're thinking mm. about the name and then the, the facial characteristics, which is, uh, which is interesting. Yeah. It's all, I like the gestalt. So we established that before. I like it when stuff connects and, uh, and even interleaving when you were talking about interleaving earlier, I wish Netflix would build more algorithms that would actually have the interleave episodes from different series, almost like the old five CD shuffle that, mm -hmm. uh, that I used to have back in the day, if there was a way to break out of the binge, because the binge is probably less good for your deep processing because you're more likely just kind of mm. going through. That's more like the massive practice kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm clearly learning. So thank you. This is where you're earning your refrigerator magnet. I feel like I'm becoming more of an expert by talking to you and listening to you about this stuff, which is really interesting. And then you've been out there in the field teaching and giving workshops and doing some of these other things. What are you observing? What kind of feedback are you getting from uh, the world outside there who is trying to navigate through this really difficult set of challenges that uh, that our teachers in particular are feeling? Any news from the field? Any, any insights? Anything you're seeing out there that you think is worthy of note? Yeah, a few things. A, people really do appreciate that just lecturing to a camera and expecting people on the other end to get something out of it is not realistic. Yeah. Uh, but they don't actually know what else to do. This active learning stuff is is not obvious. Yeah. So how you set it up. So that's been interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me amend that. It's not obvious at the beginning. One of the interesting things I've noticed is after you explain it to people, mm -hmm. then it seems very straightforward. So yeah. for example, can, let me give you an example. Uh, one of the things I always talk about because I love it is a technique that uh, someone named Elliot Aronson invented in the early 70s which is called a jigsaw classroom. It, it went nowhere for logistic reasons. You really couldn't do it very well in a standard traditional classroom, but you can do it online in Zoom, for example, yeah, right. really easily. Yep. So here's the idea. It's a series of breakout rooms where, let me give a simple example. We're gonna do a role-playing game to decide how we're gonna allocate water. So you've got farmers, you've got homeowners who need water for showers and yeah. washing dishes and you've got environmentalists who'd rather not have a lot of water wasted and right. so forth. So you, you start with a set of groups where each group is one constituency. Yeah. So there's a group for the farmers, there's a group for the homeowners. You can have multiple copies of the group, but you have one, four types of groups. Yeah. And what they're preparing for is a negotiation about the water, how much they can get. So they're, they're they know about the other stakeholders and trying to figure out what the best arguments would be. That's phase one. Mm -hmm. So the, the learning objective in this case would be to get them to understand uh, that water is a finite resource and has to be managed wisely, mm -hmm. say, okay? So this is, you've taught them in a little mini lecture about this and half of them have listened to what happened here. And now you're gonna put them in active learning where they're really gonna have to use it and process yeah. it deeply, associate all that other stuff. They're really gonna learn it. Mm -hmm. So they get exposed to it initially, now I'm going to do something. So the jigsaw classroom. First phase, they prepare for this game. Second phase, you now break them up. This is the jigsaw part. Yeah. You create new groups that say have four people in them, one from each type of the original group. So there's a, one farmer representative, one homeowner, what, et cetera, repeated. Yeah. And now you have to do the role playing 
Okay. The trick is in that first set of groups, they know that they're going to be the sole representative. You create incentives. Yes. You have to pay attention and process. Motivation is crucial. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the second groups where they do it. And then you bring them back to the first groups. You can do all this online to report back what happened, what the sticking points were, what worked well. Yeah. Notice that, again, we've got an incentive for them to pay attention and process during that second phase because they know they're going to have to report back. Right. And then finally, you reconvene the class as a whole and ask them to report out each group, what did, what happened, how to go. And yeah. you can actually grade that in various ways. The point is you engineer, you set up the situation, the act of learning mm-hmm. so that you have incentives and consequences if they don't follow through so that they will pay attention, process deeply. I'll do all that other stuff, but you don't want to just hinge it on incentives and consequences. That's extrinsic motivation. You want to take advantage of intrinsic motivation. Everybody wants to feel confident. Everybody likes the feeling of being autonomous, being allowed to try things out and maybe make mistakes. Yeah. And everybody likes social interaction, at least up to a point. Mm-hmm. The, a big prediction of retention is the feeling of belonging. Yeah, That's a huge predictor of that. You want to take advantage of those things in setting these up. Yeah, It's not just the extrinsic motivation. You need to, to take into account the fact that not only can you set up the situation to motivate them, but you should set up the very task so that it plays into what people are interested in anyway. If you do yeah. this, they enjoy it. Doesn't it take a lot of work though? Like I'm trying to think through, one of the things we're hearing a lot is just how stressed we all are. And in particular, teachers frequently are feeling a lot of that stress. And then it's unclear, we're talking about outcomes and what they're measured on. Like it's unclear to them, I think, how they're going to just get through this mm-hmm. very difficult phase in their career. So to get them motivated and even to give them the time to reflect and do the instructional design and the design thinking right. to come up with something right. really great, like a jigsaw problem, that's really tough. But do you have any thoughts on how we can help scaffold our, our educators to a better place? Yeah, I have two main things. For, first, the simplest one in that little book that I wrote, the, the last chapter is a, a large catalog of different types of active learning. Mm-hmm. That can be done both synchronously and asynchronously. Yeah. There's a lot there. You don't have to make it up. Although I, one of the reasons I'm interested in, in that the reader understanding the principles is because they're generative, great new things. So I give you a lot to springboard from. Yeah. That's, that's one. But two, I think in some ways more important is I offer these two templates that you can use as an instructor to take what you already got and rather painlessly convert it into active learning. That makes a lot of sense to to me. And then I was wondering if you have any thoughts as far as where we're heading next. Right now, we're still pretty much in the throes of the pandemic and the pandemic response. Uh, The vaccines are just starting to get out there. Many students are starting to go to K-12. They're starting to come back to some campuses. It's likely that we will not be in the strict lockdown state that we've been in indefinitely. It does look like there is likely a, a light at the end of the tunnel. What do you think will stick with us from this transformation? And then where are you expecting new and different development to begin? I think hybrid is going to become the norm. Mm. I think of hybrid as a little two by two table Mm -hmm. where I've got modes, uh, synchronous, asynchronous, and then settings in person or online. Okay. I see you got four cells there. Yeah. I love a good two by two. So thank you for that. I think you're going to see certain functionalities becoming more consistently allocated to certain modalities, cells Mm -hmm. of that two by two, partly based on efficacy. Some things like having small group interactions way easier online, like the sort that I just described where it's multi-phase and all that. Mm -hmm. But other things are way harder online, like having accidental encounters and Right. In some ways, reading nonverbal cues, things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So I think that mixed with some green eye shade stuff, economics, what scales, that sort of thing are going to create pressures Yeah, where you're going to see hybrid and that's going to be become the norm. I like that. I like predictions. They're, they're always exciting on a trend spotting show. And then the role of the teacher then is becoming more challenging. My background, because I was the live online guy at Kaplan for a long time. And part of the model there was it was always 
a teacher and at least one TA. And then it, many times that became more of a co-instructor model, team teaching. A lot of those types of concepts I think are really interesting. I know that was also built into some of your models at Minerva and, and, and Foundry College. Any perspective on that, like on the, the teaching model itself? Because it does feel like if hybrid is the future, a lone, intrepid, on-campus teacher teaching these hybrid experiences, they're going to need a lot of technical affordances added to what they can do so that they can teach both audiences at the same time, or more likely they're just going to need help. Do you have any perspective on how we might navigate becoming better at teaching hybrid? Yeah, I, th I think the first step is to figure out what sorts of functionality ought to be allocated to which of those four modalities. Yeah. I, I don't think the technology is the rate limiting step all. I think that's one thing that Zoom is really proven mm -hmm. to everyone's satisfaction is when it works well. The point is, it's not that hard to use, not that yep. hard to set up polls, not hard to set up breakout rooms. It's going to get easier and easier. And presumably there'll be additional features added that'll facilitate things like those sequences of breakout rooms that I was describing with the big jigsaw. Yeah. So I don't see the technology as being the rate limiting step. I think it's really understanding how best to exploit the different modality, the active learning piece. You can do that asynchronously and synchronously. When yep. is it best to do each of them? I don't know yet. I can tell you though that feedback is way faster with synchronous. So for some kinds of learning where you need feedback, like some deliberate practice, you need it quickly. You're gonna to wanna to do that live. Right. Whereas for other things where it may need to sync in mm -hmm. and you need to go over it repeatedly, maybe asynchronous is better. Yeah. So these kind of detailed principles, to my knowledge, have yet to be worked out. But I think to the extent they do get worked out, that's the kind of thing that instructors are going to need to master more than just the technology per se. Yeah. I see things very similarly to what you're describing. I'm almost envisioning a new role emerging. It's somewhere between an instructional designer and a teacher and a product person. It's almost like a next generation model of a teacher or a learning professional is going to be more equipped to do the type of design that you're describing. But I still think it's going to very much move to more of a team model. Maybe it's just because I've spent so much time in software development, product development, which is typically thought of as a team dynamic. But do you have any thoughts on that? Here's how I think of it. I'm thinking about scaling, mm -hmm. like 10,000 people in, in courses that are hybrid. So there's parts that are asynchronous and there are parts that are synchronous. Mm. Say the whole thing is online. How do you do those five principles? How do you implement a deliberate practice? We just, I just mentioned that. Yeah. What you can do, take the Ben Franklin approach, where you have groups produce some work product and then give them a model and they work off of that and then trying to improve what they're doing so it's more like the model. Yeah. And then what you can do is you can combine groups. We do this at Foundry College all the time. We call it terrifying. Yeah, uh, Beth, Beth Callahan came up with that term. Mm -hmm. um, and you give them a rubric and you ask them to basically give formative feedback to each other, to grade each other. Someone has got to be checking at least some of the time to make sure the students are using the rubric properly. So that's a role for teaching assistants or something. Yeah. This massively scale. So I think it's going to be different. I think the roles for the team, it's going to be a team. Yeah are not going to be the same as they have been in more traditional kind of contexts. Mm -hmm. I think the economics are going to push large scaling if, with, with effective active learning built in. Yeah. Um, and there's going to be a role for running the whole thing mm -hmm. by a team, which yeah. has got to scale. It can't, it can't be one teaching assistant for each section or something. That's not yeah. going to work. Yeah, yeah. So all, all that is going to work itself out. I, I expect the next year we're going to see enormous progress and all this sort of thing. Yeah. And it's going to require a lot of uh, design thinking and broader perspective. And it's uh, it's amazing if it can be informed by the science of learning, uh, which is why we always love to get your perspective, uh, Stephen, and can keep doing what you're doing. As we're about to wrap up here, any uh, concluding thoughts, any words of wisdom as we wrap up our conversation here? First, I'd like to thank you for doing this. And I don't mean just because I'm getting a refrigerator magnet. And believe me, there's a lot of real estate in a refrigerator for this still. But I, I think it's really great that you bring in different people, get different perspectives and make it accessible by asking questions to make sure things are really clear. Because I think there's a lot going on now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a time of great fulfillment for various reasons. And it's really important that as many people as possible be in touch with the process of development, not just be handed something at the end, but actually be able to take part 
And so I hope there's a mechanism um, at some point where anyone who's listening to this can provide feedback to you that you can then loop out to the audience. That would be yeah. really great. Yeah, makes sense. Great, uh, great feedback and a great contribution from uh, Dr. Stephen Coslin, who's got a new book out, Active Learning Online. And uh, we've been actively talking in this podcast. Thank you for listening. Thanks again to Stephen for joining. If you like what you're hearing, tell a friend, write us a review. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. Mm-hmm.